Hello and welcome to the third webinar in the 2017 Organic Seed Production Webinar Series presented by the Organic Seed Alliance and the Multinational Exchange for Sustainable Agriculture. This is your host, Alice Formiga of the eOrganic community of eExtension. You can find all eOrganic articles, videos, and recorded webinars on organic farming and research on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. This presentation will last about an hour with a break for questions after the first presenter. We'll be reading as many questions as we can after the presentation is over as well. So today we're very pleased to welcome Jody Lou Smith of High Mowing Seeds along with Jared Zeistro of the Organic Seed Alliance. Jody will start with a discussion of some of the most common seedborne diseases and then we'll have some time to ask her questions. After that, Jared will follow with a discussion of disease prevention and management in organic seed crops. Jody Lou Smith is a vegetable breeder and product development director at High Mowing Seeds, and Jared is the assistant director of research and education at the Organic Seed Alliance. So thank you for joining us today, Jody and Jared, and I am now going to hand over the screen control to you, Jody. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the very, uh, I'm going to talk about seedborne disease, starting with the, a review of the biology behind pathogens and the kind of pathogens that infect our, our vegetable crops. And then I'm going to work um, a little bit quickly the worst of the seedborne diseases. And some of these will be viruses, some of these will be bacteria, and some of these will be fungi. And I'm going to try to keep these straight as I move through, and hopefully I won't talk too fast. So, um, I begin with a reminder for all muted that in organics, we don't have the kind of toolbox you have in a conventional, more chemical system. And so our key strategy is that we have to prevent disease wherever we can. We don't have a lot of treatment options. And so that means that we have to always have knowledge as our tool. And that really requires that we understand a little bit more about the pathogens that infect crops. We don't have a lot of options for just preventive spraying. I can't stress enough that you should not be afraid of a home germination test. This is a really valuable tool. You don't need special materials. You don't need special. You can do this in regular home, in regular paper towels on your kitchen counter. And it's really valuable both for the seed that you're going to be planting in your gardens or farms, and also for any seed that you harvest from your garden or farm. It's a really quick way to look at seedlings and see if there's disease that came from the seed. This is cotton, because this just happens to be the crop that I found the best pictures of. But you can see that these symptoms are showing up both on the, um, on the, the uh, cotyledons, on the stem, and on the roots. So getting good at looking at seedlings is a really nice beginning to understanding pathogens. OK, so I'm going to try to do this as quickly and painlessly as possible. And this is basically you know, first year biology review of the three types of pathogens, where bacteria are the first, probably not the most common. They're probably less common than either fungi or viruses, but they often tend to be the worst diseases. There's bad things and good things about each of these. The bad things about bacteria are that once they're in your crops in the field, they are systemic, meaning inside the system, meaning they're inside the veins of the plant, and you can't do anything about it once it's in your field. Pretty much that's done. But if you have it in your seed, it's very treatable. Fungi are pretty much the opposite. They are topical. Most fungi spread by spores that infect the surface of the plants, and this means that they are treatable in the field. But because they're on the surface of the seed, um, or they can occasionally get on the inside of the seed, they tend to not be as resistant to the organic methods for um, controlling disease by heat. So they're much more treatable in fields than on seed. Viruses, the one good thing about viruses is that they are not as destructive as either bacteria or fungi. However, they're also not treatable 
either on seed or in the field. Okay, I've got three busy slides in a row that I'm going to just go through quickly. I'm not going to read the slides, and I just want to hit the highlights, and then you can have these as a resource if you are interested in thinking more about the differences between the types of pathogens. So bacteria, as I just said, I'm going to go back a second, is systemic, meaning it's inside the plant. And the reason for that is that bacteria are simple cells that have no walls. So they can't live in a dry environment. They always have to have moisture, which means they have to be inside the plant or inside an insect vector. Those are the two places you will find them. But they, because they're inside the plant, they also tend to get inside the seed. And this is a picture of Xanthomonas campestris, one of the worst bacterial pathogens on a plate here. You can see that it's kind of just a squishy, gooey ooze. Um, what's nice, the one nice thing about bacteria is if you do have it inside your seed, it's exquisitely sensitive to heat. You can kill it. Fungi are have hard cell walls. They're a very different organism than a bacteria. They spread by spores, as I said. Um, you can set them back in the field, but you will rarely get rid of them completely. Some of them are sensitive to heat and can be killed on the seed, and others are not. Viruses are actually not alive, meaning they're not full cells, which means they're very hard to kill. They are basically just little um, replication packages of DNA or RNA. There's several different kinds of viruses. They're all pretty much look the same, act the same, and they could often be very hard to tell apart. Um, however, they do make different proteins, and these proteins are what you're detecting when you use strip tests. And a strip test is essentially the same thing as a pregnancy test in that you have a liquid that climbs a little stick where if you have the protein in question, in this case, a protein made by a virus, it'll make an extra line on the stick. It's the same exact methodology. And there are now stick strip tests for some of the worst seed-borne viruses. And these are really valuable tools. They're available from Agadia, and that's in the list of resources at the end, I believe. OK, so if you're a seed grower or if you are even a gardener or a uh, farmer, it's important to even know which the worst diseases are to out because the ones that I call red alert diseases that are highly seed borne and highly virulent can pretty much wipe out your crop. This middle class I call orange alert. Um, these are highly, these can be either highly seed borne but not all that virulent. By virulent I mean kill the plant in the field. Um, or they can be very virulent, but not often carried on seed. And then I'm not going to talk about the yellow ones today. These are kind of the weak pathogens that are very common, like early blight and tomato. You see these all the time. They don't kill the plant. They can travel on seed, but they more often live in soil, live on debris. They're, they're weakly seed borne, weakly virulent. So there are only a few of the worst of these, these red alert diseases, and the worst ones are in the brassica crops. So I'm going to talk about five crops today, and let's see if I can remember them. It's brassica, carrots, onions, tomatoes, um, and maybe there's one more. Okay, these are the two worst diseases. If you know these two, you're ahead of the game. And it turns out that this has become a serious problem in Washington State where Black leg and black rot are both common, and they've now um, created a seed quarantine for that whole region so that we cannot, nobody can sell seed to that region that has not been tested for these diseases. Um, so this is good in a way because if seed companies are testing for these diseases to sell to Washington, it generally means that all the seed they're selling to all the other parts of the country is also getting tested because it's the same lots and they all get tested. And so you can now often ask for this test, da test data and be able to prevent any seed with these diseases to coming to your, to your place. Um, there's your both bacteria, no, sorry. One is a bacteria and one is a fungus. The worst one is the bacteria. This is the one that we saw a couple slides back as a slimy uh, goo on a Petri plate. 
This is Xanthomonas campestris, the black bra dreaded black brassica black rot. Not easy to say. It's the number one seedborne disease. It's very, very virulent and it spreads really quickly. It is sensitive to hot water and to steam, so you can kill it in seed, but it's so virulent that it's um, not something you want to mess around with. These are the symptoms. What's really nice about it is it's very distinctive. It's always in these little uh, veins. It starts at the tips of the veins and it has a really distinctive look in the field. You always see it at the leaf margins and it has this triangular shape. And pretty soon this plant will have melted at, to be flat on the ground. So I'm not going to read these prevention slides. They're really more here for reference. Um, but um, they are all slightly different. I tried really hard to think clearly about these prevention recommendations so they're not boilerplate and they are actually particular to these diseases. Okay, black leg, as I said, is a fungus. It now has two names. Um, it's not nearly as common as black rot, but it is around. It has been found in Washington State and Oregon over the last several years and has, there was a real outbreak I think it was two years ago that was just um, very damaging to a lot of crops. All, it, it actually acts a whole lot like black rot in that it um, also spreads really quickly in warm humid weather. Um, it's not quite as explosive but it is able to survive in the field longer because it is a fungi. It too though is sensitive to hot water and possibly to steam. We haven't tried that yet. Here's some symptoms. Um, it's called black leg because it tends to often attack the leg of the plant, the stem, the lower stem, or the upper part of the root. And it is often diagnosed by having these black spots that are called pycnidia. Um, if you see these black spots anywhere on dead tissue, they're almost always a sign that you're dealing with fungus because these pycnidia are the structures that fungi form to then disperse their spores. These will burst and send spores out. Here's some more symptoms. This is in um, cabbage. It's either cabbage or broccoli. Um, again, the legs get it first, but and the stem on the spots on the leaves are not nearly as distinctive as the spots on the on the, the lower stem. And again, here's some prevention details. Okay, moving on to lettuce. That was my fifth one. I forgot lettuce. In lettuce, there are a number of lettuce diseases that are more and less destructive. Most of them, um, many of them are soil borne, not seed borne, and they tend to be worse in wet climates. The one that's very seed borne and definitely problematic is lettuce mosaic virus. Um, this is good to talk about a virus after a bacteria and a fungi because they really are very different. The viruses are just a very unique set. This one is very seed borne and is very common. It's especially a problem on the West Coast. It spreads mostly by insects. It's not deadly, it won't kill the whole plant, but it will persist year after year after year in seed. The symptoms um, can be hard to tell from other viruses in the field, especially from CMV, which is a very common virus, but it has a strip test and useful for lettuce mosaic virus prevention. What's interesting about LMV is that it doesn't show up on every type of lettuce. Some show symptoms and some don't. This is typical symptoms that clear looking um, mottled look is often virus. Um, again, that strip test is very valuable, but a lot of LMV, uh, a lot of lettuce seed comes with what's called an MTO test. That's for lettuce mosaic virus. It means mosaic tested and I can't remember what the O stands for. Um, so, and you can also rogue out virus. This is important because if you rogue it quickly and early, you often can prevent the spread. The other thing I'll just mention in this prevention is that if you are a commercial seed grower, it's important to ask this question of whoever you're growing the seed for because there is so much LMV in seed that there are crops that are not required to be virus free where low levels are tolerated. So it's important to ask that question if you're selling seed. 
Okay, moving to a different crop now. We're in carrot. Um, carrot um, doesn't have any red alert diseases. It only has a couple that I call orange alert. These are both, um, they look really similar. They all look, and actually um, there's three here. There's one bacterial blight and two fungal blights that look very similar, um, but they sort of all behave in the same way. They're all, um, they're all uh, highly seed borne, but they're not extremely virulent. They won't kill the whole plant. Um, this is the bacterial blight. Um, it creates these kinds of um, shiny type of um, dead tissue on the leaves, and then it will progress down the stem of the leaf. The two, um, so these, uh, I won't read these, but um, these are pretty standard. Um, the two fungal blights are really similar. Um, Alternaria and Cercospora, these are both also found on beets, beets and carrots, uh, not the exact same species, but similar related species. Um, these are, again, they don't kill the whole plant, and these are slightly less seed borne than the bacterial blight. Um, these can often occur in the same field, in the same crop, um, but um, they um, are, it's, it's not unusual to find them in the same one. And their, their damage is mostly just by losing so much leaf tissue that you um, lose, you reduce your yields. Um, symptoms, uh, these are more round, these are less round, more irregular. Okay, and prevention is pretty standard again for these. Okay, other aspects to carrot seed quality, if anybody is growing commercial carrot seed, the prevention of crossing to Queen Anne's lace is a real factor in carrot seed because um, it's very common to have Queen Anne's lace as a weed and it will always cross with carrot. Um, it's also a tough crop to grow in climates where um, the, the environmental conditions don't favor quality and that's often cooler climates. Carrot likes heat. It often does best in Eastern Washington and Eastern Oregon. Okay, moving on to onion. I'm only gonna talk about one, a fungal disease called onion white rot. <clears throat> it's a fung, as I said, a fungus. This is an unusual one in that it doesn't travel in or on the seed itself, but it's kind of these black sclerotia that kind of look like mouse poo, and they get mixed in with the seed because they're both black. Um, this is symptoms, you've probably all seen this. It's also a very common disease on beans, especially garden beans, and you'll see it on a lot of other crops as well. But it's a problem in seed on onion because onion seed is black and looks very much like the sclerotia. It's very easy to clean the sclerotia out of something like beans. Um, again, fluffy mold and then these black spores and black sclerotia. Um, again, purity testing. If it's a reputable company doing purity testing, this would get picked up. Okay, last crop, tomato. Um, tomato um, has a lot of diseases. So um, I'm going to talk about um, one virus, and the virus is the worst of them because it's the most common, and it's also the most highly seed borne. And then I'm going to talk about three bacterial diseases that are that are all pretty similar to one another. They're slightly different. Um, bacteria, but your prevention strategies are pretty much the same. So, tobacco mosaic virus is the same as to, to sorry, I called it tobacco mosaic virus. It's tomato mosaic virus, but effectively is the same as tobacco mosaic virus. And it's highly, highly seed borne. And it's very, very common. And as I said, um, for the viruses, there is a good strip test available from Agdia. And if you are growing any number of um, tomato seeds or if you are saving tomato seed, I recommend that you get some of these strip tests and use them before you plant the seed. You can actually do the test on 25 seeds by crushing them and putting them in the buffer and letting the strip test tell you if there's virus. Um, symptoms are, again, mild like all viruses, uh, pretty distinctive, that mottled virus look. What's problematic with tomato, tomato mosaic virus 
is in the fruit, unlike some of the other viruses that affect tomato. And it's a problem on the fruit. It's pretty much unmarketable. And you can transfer it from anyone who smokes. This is where it's really a problem, um, if, especially if you're doing tomatoes as for plug sales. It's really important that people all wear gloves and that nobody who's been smoking touches the plants. Um, we've had our most uh, devastating outbreaks of TMV by buying in uh, trial samples from these kind of thousand tomato companies like who sell nothing but tomatoes and a thousand different ones. A lot of those companies have a lot of problems main, uh, controlling this disease. And I just caution you to be super careful. We don't plant any of that seed unless we strip, do a strip test on it. Um, gloves, especially for smokers. And um, again, you can rogue virus out if you're watching for it. And you want to rogue really early and you want to get it out. And if you flag areas where you've seen virus, then you can keep looking. And again, just like the lettuce mosaic virus, again, you want to ask about your end market, whether there is a requirement that it be completely virus free. Okay, now we're switching to these tomato bacterial diseases. Um, there's these three bacterial canker, bacterial spot, and bacterial speck. Um, they're all highly seed borne, but they're only moderately virulent. Um, but they do particularly cause damage in greenhouses where it tends to be more moist. Again, bacteria always need to be moist. They always need water. They often, um, they often get transferred by splashing or hands that are wet or by insects, the wet gut of an insect. Um, but they are all sensitive to hot, to heat, either by hot water or aerated steam. Okay, I'm just going to show you quickly these symptoms. Bacterial canker is the one pretty much exclusively found in greenhouse, greenhouse tomatoes, and it has this really distinctive bird's eye spot look to it. Um, bacterial spet spot, sorry, can be outdoors or in the field or in a greenhouse. It's more common, I think, in the field, and it has a kind of raised spot, and it will infect green fruit. Bacterial speck also infects green fruit, but it's, by the, like the name implies, it's a much smaller spot, and they're more shallow. Uh, that's all three of them together. Um, the leaf and stem symptoms are so similar that you would ha really have difficulty telling them apart, um, so you're better off focusing on the fruit symptoms. Okay, they're all treated the same. Um, clean seed. This really is important, especially that you have heat treated steam or steam treated seed because it controls all of them at once. So it's really valuable. And a lot of seed companies do preventatively heat treat tomato these days. Um, and again, any symptoms out of the field, and if you really if you have managed to spread them to all your plants in the field, you really should just pull them all up, get them out of your field, and start over the next year. Okay, um, that wraps it up for tomato. Um, I do have a couple slides of resources here that will stay with the um, presentation. And um, Alice, I am happy to take questions. Unmuted. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. Since Jody is going to have to head out a little bit early before the very end of the webinar, um, now's your chance to ask her questions if you have any. So um, we have one or two there now already. Um, one person is interested in knowing how to detect bacteria or fungi or viruses on the seed before germination. Is there a way to do that or do you just have to get um, tested seed or do you have any recommendations? Right. Um, you really, um, so fungal diseases will often um, show up when you germinate. You can't really just look at a seed and see if there's a disease. You really have to at least try to germinate some of the seed. Often it, fungal diseases, if, they're, if the seed is heavily infested, will just look fuzzy. Um, your germ test will look like has mold on it. Uh, it's, those are easiest to tell. Bacterial diseases, um, you can't tell often right away. You really would have to grow that plant a little bigger, and then you would start to see the diseases. Um, and same with viruses. You really couldn't detect that until the plant was a little bit larger. 
Okay, great. Um, this is more of a general question, but um, we can take it anyway. Um, when you are, um, when a beginner starts to produce organic products, he might need to start with a non-organic seed. Will there be any effect on the final organic output produced in terms of yield or quality? Either one of you could pitch in on this one. Um, we have done that plenty where there wasn't, um, especially when we're trying to bring a new variety into being available as organic seed, we have to start with conventional seed. And usually you wouldn't expect there to be a, a, a negative impact on yield or quality um, just because it's conventional seed as much as by whether it's grown in an organic system. And when you grow a crop for the first time in an organic system, you're probably going to see variability among individual plants, and that's where you would make selection. That is all the food for selection, because you want to choose the ones that are doing the best in the system that you will. If you're choosing the best plants in an organic system and then saving seed from those plants, you will have increased the heritable traits that make those make that variety successful in an organic system. Okay, thank you. Um, if anyone else has any more questions, now's a great time to uh, enter them. And um, if not, um, we will move on to Jared in just a moment, um, who is going to start here. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be covering, uh, after uh, Jody covered some of the, the details of how Muted. diseases work and some of the details of some of the most important diseases, my piece of this webinar is going to be talking a little bit uh, in terms of an overview of how do you think about managing those diseases in your seed crops. So the first step in that, sorry, there we go, is here, I'll go through my outline here first. So what I'm gonna be talking about uh, briefly is how to consider potential pathogens, understanding you know which pathogens you need to be aware of and a little bit of that has some overlap with what Jody just talked about but then going through in somewhat chronological order once you are aware of the pathogens you need to be concerned about first reducing opportunities for those pathogens to be in your field or on your seed crop second um, choosing varieties that will help reduce the risk of those pathogens being a problem for you third uh, managing environmental conditions in your field, and then finally managing those diseases as they appear. As Jody talked about, kind of, and, and Jody has, a, I think, a really great way of explaining it in terms of that color coding. When you're a farmer, you are likely to encounter many, many diseases of various severity on your crops. And as you gain experience in your crops and in your area, you're going to become more and more familiar with what those diseases are and which ones are really important. But as kind of a way to prioritize as you're going into a seed crop, um, the ones that you want to focus on initially in terms of your understanding, in terms of your, your research and your, your focusing your, your practices to prevent, those are going to be ones that are um, first, you know, the ones that are virulent, as Jody said, and, and seed-borne, so ones that you know are likely to cause uh, problems, you know, large problems in the crop, and then are seed-borne, and then um, certainly ones that are found in your area. Although, as uh, you know, as was clear from Jody's presentation, because you're dealing with, you know, if you're dealing with seed-borne diseases, just because a disease isn't currently present in your area, there are still always going to be that risk that that disease might be coming in with the seed and all of a sudden will be present in your area. So that alone is, is, is you know, if just because something isn't present in your area now doesn't mean that you um, don't need to be aware of it, but uh, pay extra attention to ones that you know are present in your area. So once you have kind of an idea of what some of the high risk diseases are in the seed crops that you're going to be growing, how do you learn about how to handle them? Well, talking to a pathologist, you know, such as, as Jody, you know, certainly if you're a 
a seed grower who is growing under contract. It's, uh, you know, many seed companies like High Mowing do have resources for you to be able to under manage the important diseases. Uh, there's also many references out there, including that, that great long list of references that Jody provided at the end of her webinar. And really, the key to understanding this is, you know, understanding, okay, how does this disease, you know, what is its life cycle? You know, just like Jody was talking about the difference between what, you know, a fungus needs versus a virus versus uh, bacteria, you know, and how that affects um, its reproduction, understanding kind of what are its climatic preferences, um, what kind of temperatures and moisture regimes does it thrive under? What are some of the alternate hosts that it may exist on? And, um, you know, how can it be managed and controlled? A lot of that will be uh, available to you through references or through uh, the advice of uh, plant pathologists. So once you have a sense of, you know, some of the understanding of the diseases that you need to be aware of and, and how um, they reproduce, the first step in thinking about this is before you ever um, plant in your field, you want to be thinking about how do you reduce opportunities for that those diseases to occur in your field. And this is these are some of the steps. First is thinking about crop rotations. So is any of those these diseases that are born uh, either in you know are either able to survive in soil or able to survive on crop residue, um, you want to be thinking about what were the prior crops in that field are, were they of this, in, were they plants that those diseases can potentially survive on or um, plants that potentially they could have grown in and then are currently surviving in the soil from. So this would be often members of the same you know obviously the same species but then often members of the same family as well can be something that you want to rotate out of, meaning that you wouldn't want to plant, um, you know, something in the solanaceous family, in the, you know, tomato, potato family, um, you know, in subsequent years on the same patch of ground. Um, but often there may be uh, diseases that can survive and grow in, across multiple families. And so understanding which of those families a disease can uh, survive and, and, and grow in, in in trying to rotate your field so that 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 disease that so that there's a break in the um, disease cycle for that so that it's uh, you have, are growing multiple years of a crop where a disease is unable to uh, to, to survive be, before you go back to a, a crop that may be at risk of a disease is, is part of your rotation management um, second is residue management and this is an interesting one in terms of you know good often good organic practices you know involve maintaining some degree of you know incorporation of um, you know of crops and, and and potentially leaving some residue intact to um, you know to prevent erosion to increase organic matter that being said you want to be aware of you know for diseases that can survive on crop residue, um, thinking about you know whether or not you want to leave that residue in the field, and again whether or not you um, that residue is something that can carry that disease. So you know that kind of goes back to the rotating of uh, between families and, and between crops that um, can provide uh, a habitat for those diseases. Finally. Um, terms of reducing opportunities, many of these diseases can survive uh, on alternate hosts, which can be either uh, other crops in your say, you know, in your field, or even uh, weeds that exist, you know, in your field or on the, um, you know, the unmanaged parts of your farm, um, the, the field edges, fence rows, et cetera, um, being aware of, you know, what weeds provide uh, or act as hosts for important diseases for your seed crops and making sure to keep an eye on them make sure that there doesn't uh, that the diseases you're concerned about aren't surviving on those and likewise any volunteer plants that might be existing in your fields 
uh, making sure that those aren't carrying any diseases before you even you know get to the point of, of planting another place to try and prevent diseases from getting a foothold in your seed crops is as jody mentioned being very cautious about bringing seedborne diseases onto your farm through the seed so again as jody mentioned you know being aware of what those diseases are being aware whether or not the seed that you're getting has been tested for the diseases potentially performing your own germination tests or strip tests before you plant if there's a concern uh, another place uh, for some of these diseases can be through the uh, your trays that you you, know, you are using to propagate your seedlings um, so making sure that you are following some uh, sanitary procedures sterilizing your seedling trays between crops so that you're not carrying so that they're not acting as a vector and you're not carrying forward diseases uh, from crop to crop if there are diseases that are known to be problematic in your area and are um, one tool that you may have available to you is if you have some options around what varieties you're going to be growing for seed um, if there are options to be able to grow varieties that have genetic resistance to those diseases, um, that's something to, to look at as a possibility. Um, oftentimes you may be somewhat limited in terms of the crops that uh, you can get the contract for with the seed company, uh, but if this is something that could be worth having a conversation with the seed company, or if you're growing your seed crops on you know, for your own retail sales or on speculation, taking a look and seeing, you know, what 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 uh, disease resistance exists out there, and considering planting crops that have resistance to uh, diseases that are seedborne and and common in your area is one tool in your toolbox. So, once you've managed the uh, conditions of your field and uh, selected appropriate varieties. Once you've got these seeds in the ground, these plants in the ground that they're growing, what are some of the ways that you can try and reduce the risk of diseases, of seedborne diseases uh, becoming a problem in your field? Well, some of this is just basic disease management. So uh, one of the, the first steps in reducing the virulence of diseases and reducing the likelihood that the diseases are going to be taking over is just keeping your plants happy, avoiding crop stress, making sure that they're able to experience, um, you know, uninterrupted, healthy growth, that they're getting sufficient water, they're getting sufficient nutrients, that there's, uh, you know, they have sufficient room to grow. Um, all of these things are going to lead to more vigorous plants that are better able to resist infection. Um, another thing to keep in mind, again, I think for those of you who attended some of our earlier webinars on crop uh, seed crop planning, it's because of the, the, the nature of seed crops is one in which typically you are planting a given seed crop once in the year and then that is growing and then you're harvesting it once and you're not you're not succession planting these seed crops. So depending on the length of the um, season required to mature that seed crop versus your total season length, you may have some wiggle room in terms of when you can plant your seed crop. And so if you have an understanding of what the most common and problematic uh, diseases could be for your seed crop, you may be able to plant uh, you may be able to time your planting in a way in order to avoid conditions that are most favorable to those diseases. In other words, if the diseases grow really well in uh, cool conditions in early spring, you may want to uh, push your planting later. Or if the diseases are, you know, potentially really problematic, if you start to get um, any kind of, you know, rain in the fall, you know, you may want to push your timing a little bit earlier so that you can be sure to you know harvest before you know any uh, precipitation happens in the fall so understanding kind of what the disease life cycle is and whether or not you have the wiggle room to, to to 
find a good window for growing your your seed crop um, in at a time that isn't as favorable for your disease is is one more tool you have. Another important aspect of managing environmental conditions is thinking about airflow. So for many of these diseases, for you know, for both the you know the bacteria, as Jody said, uh, is you know they are often very dependent on moisture uh, to be able to survive and reproduce. But also many fungi, uh, you know, have similar requirements in terms of having you know wanting humidity to be able to grow and sporulate and spread. Um, one of the tools that you can use to reduce humidity in your seed crops is by first ensuring that you have adequate spacing for your seed crops. So we talked about this again on an earlier webinar, but for many seed crops, you want to have increased uh, spacing both within rows and between rows compared to if you're growing these crops just for uh, say vegetable production. If these crops are going all the way to seed maturation, they're often getting larger uh, than they would be otherwise. And in addition, because um, airflow management is such a priority in terms of managing diseases, you may want to look at increasing your spacing. Likewise, you want to think about how you orient your rows. If you have any flexibility in terms of the direction that your rows are facing, you want to try and orient them so that the prevailing winds can travel through so that they're getting maximum sunlight. You know, all of these things just to increase the or decrease humidity within the rows, increase the speed that things dry out in the morning. Um, finally, avoiding uh, overhead watering is often a key to uh, reducing the risk of diseases as we've talked about before. You know, if you can see the slide here, we've got drip tape on these um, on these plants. And so especially once uh, your seed crops are beginning to go into reproductive phase, beginning to flower, you want to make sure to be avoiding overhead watering as much as possible. Likewise, um, if uh, if you can, uh, timing, certainly if you are forced to overhead water, but um, regardless, what you want to do is time your watering so that the plants can, uh, the, the leaves and the, of the plants can be drying and the stems of the plants can dry quickly after watering. So in other words, if you have a choice, you're going to want to water, um, you know, in the morning rather than in the evening. So that way, you know, as after watering is completed, you've got a stretch of sunny, dry, uh, you know, daytime weather that can dry out your plants before they get into the evening hours. You don't want to be uh, starting your watering, you know, late in the afternoon and leaving your, your plants wet as it gets dark, um, because that just increases the, the time period that is, you know, when, when your plants are, are wet and that just allows the diseases to grow throughout that whole time period. So done these preventative steps, what do you do if you do start to see symptoms? Well, you know, the first step is, you know, making sure that you understand what disease you do have in your field. So identifying, you know, what that disease is by taking a, you know, a photo of it, taking a, a, a tissue sample, you know, consulting with a pathologist, you know, with your local extension or with, uh, you know, your seed company, if you're contracting seed, trying to make sure you really do understand what you have in the field and understand, you know, what measures you need to take. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, if depending on what the disease is, that's going to be a range of measures. Uh, First is often just going to be to rogue out, to remove any infected plants. And typically you're going to be, you know, removing not just, you know, the infected plant, but probably it, its uh, neighbors as well, assuming that, you know, some degree of spread has already occurred that you can't see. So um, removing them and then, and then making sure you're getting them well out of the field, um, you know, destroying them, you know, however that may be by, you know, burying, burning, um, but trying to make sure that the, you know, that the spores are not spreading 
um, and that you're reducing that, you know, the, the amount of spores that are in your field. So that way, hopefully, you can kind of nip it in the bud. If there are, um, you know, organically, you know, approved, OMRI approved disease controls that are, you know, known to be effective, applying those. And then finally, one of the, the hardest decisions, but, um, you know, does certainly come up as a, as a seed grower is knowing when, you know, this really is uh, at a point where you can't control this, where you're not going to be able to be confident that you're going to be getting a disease-free seed crop out of your field and, and knowing when it's um, time to go ahead and, you know, destroy the field, till it in and um, call it for the year before, um, before you've invested any more time into something that's fruitless and before you've, um, you know, created too much, you know, so much of a inoculum load that it's potentially spreading elsewhere. Finally, what I was, I, I wanted to mention is that one of the um, ways to reduce uh, diseases to some extent um, without, and is, you know, there can be, um, if, if, if you've got a small amount of, of, of you know, not as quite as virulent disease on your seed, um, what you want to ensure is that that disease is not spreading on your harvested seed. And so, you know, one of the important steps in, in managing diseases in seed is, is actually after harvest. So you want to, you know, after you harvest your seed, uh, make sure that you get that seed clean and you get it dry because, um, you know, often for many of these diseases, the the chaff, the the pieces of stem and leaf that may be still um, intermixed with the seed when you're after you do your initial rough harvest, those are going to be where there is a greater pathogen load than on the seed itself because the the stems and leaves are more porous. They can more easily uh, and they're less dense, so they can more easily hold both diseases and moisture. Um, in them, and so by you know cleaning your seed well and then getting it uh, very dry, um, that will reduce the risk that pathogens are kind of continuing to, to to grow and spread in your seed after it's harvested. So that concludes my my brief overview of unmuted meant for uh, seedborne diseases and seed crops. And at this point, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Um, meanwhile, I have a question, and that is if you could talk a little bit more on um, how to dispose of infected plant material. Yeah, so again, this is going to kind of depend on what the, um, you know, what the, the disease is and how it spreads, um, you know, and so that's going to be somewhat crop specific, but, you know, I mean, it, you know, it could be you know, you know, it, it could, you know, if if the risk of um, spreading is one that's, you know, relatively low, then it can just be, you know, pulling those seeds out of the field and putting them, you know, putting it far enough away, you know, and, and, and you know, composting those those plants um, and that the you know, composting operation can, you know, take care of it. Um, if it's something that's uh, more potentially problematic, then you may need to either um, you can you can bury it, you know, as long as you're you know kind of burying it uh, deep enough so that it's um, not going to be uh, you know near the surface so that the uh, um, disease is you know if it is something that's certainly if it's soil borne, um, then you know you don't want to have something that's right by the surface. Um, the final you know tool that I see for some you know more highly variant things is basically just to you know, build a big fire and burn those plants. Okay. Um, if you had to destroy your field, how long should you wait to plant again? And what should you do with the field in the meantime? So, you know, again, this will, you know, it, it comes down to a crop by crop basis and sort of what, you know, that disease is. Um, the, you know, if, if it's something that is, um, soil borne, then you need to look at, you know, kind of the length of how long that will survive in the field. And then that comes down to, you know, practicing rotations. So going, you know, you know, because many of these diseases really are specific to uh, specific families, you know, or, you know, or specific um, crops, 
you'll still most likely be able to find other crops that you can grow in that field in subsequent years that are not susceptible to those diseases. And so you'll just essentially need to let that field rest for as many years as that um, disease can survive in the soil. You'll need to let it rest from the crops that uh, it can grow in and grow other crops instead. If it's something that's not soil borne, then you know as long as you are you know sufficiently incorporated all of the crop residue and um, you know you you are able to incorporate it in you know early in the season and you know early enough in the season so that you have you know kind of the rest of the season and the winter to you know ensure all of those um, pieces are kind of fully uh, digested by the soil. You know you can potentially be planting something into there you know the next year. Obviously, you know, even with something that's not soil borne, probably your wisest course of action is to at least give it a year rotation to a you know non susceptible crop before you come back into it with a susceptible crop. Okay, great. I just want to thank everyone for submitting questions and remind um, you that we're going to be putting up the recording of this webinar along with the other webinars that we have archived in this series on the eOrganic webinar archive. So um, thank you everyone for coming and thank you so much Jody and Jared and we hope that you can all join us for the other webinars in this series.